Um, well, I was, of course, correctly introduced as the Emeritus Professor of, uh, of uh, International Law, and um, a colleague of mine not very long ago introduced me um, and said, uh, Emeritus is Latin for has-been. Well, I'm not quite a has-been. I have stepped down from five years uh, as president of the Australian Human Rights Commission, uh, and uh, it's liberating, absolutely wonderful to be freer, at least, to be a little clearer uh, and, and more frank about where uh, some of these issues uh, that we're going to talk about today are taking us. Um, I have been asked to speak to you in a very broad topic in a very little amount of time, uh, but the challenges for women leaders uh, in uh, what is really a post-truth environment. How do we manage uh, to be the kinds of women in the professional environment that we were educated to be? We were educated to be uh, fact-based, to get our research right, to speak and write in, in moderate and accurate terms to inform policy and to inform the law. That is increasingly difficult in the post-truth environment that we now live in, where there is an extraordinary tendency to look to uh, subjective views or where we take those bits of the massive information available to us to inform entrenched views. We live in rooms of mirrors with social media. Well, I have been then asked today to talk to you about the challenges that women face uh, in developing uh, their careers. And, and today, we're a group of women who are lawyers, accountants, financial advisors, and management managers in professions that have long been and continue to be dominated by men. So how can women be more effective leaders with the necessary resilience to deflect the setbacks and criticisms that are now common? In many respects, of course, I can say that from my position, I've been a practicing barrister and solicitor for 50 years come next March. I'm really surprised that the issues of these, that, that I've been asked to talk about here and, and across the country um, should even be raised in the second decade of the 21st century. For as an evolving uh, feminist law student at the University of Melbourne in the early 60s, I'm surprised and disappointed by the evidence of the regression of women in economic and political empowerment in Australia, particularly over the last decade. Well, before I explain this um, sadly negative observation, it might be useful to illustrate what it can be like as president of the Australian Human Rights Commission to attract the ire of the politically powerful, a fate that I hope that you will never suffer as tax advisors if you're wise enough to stay away from the political arena. Well, as you may remember, over my five-year term, I was subject to criticism from the government, the Prime Minister and the Attorney General, enthusiastically echoed by the conservative media for embarking on an inquiry into the mental and physical impact of long-term, apparently indefinite detention of children and their families in offshore and onshore detention center, centers. The inquiry led to a report to Parliament entitled The Forgotten Children, a report that was rejected out of hand as biased against the government, despite the objective fact that the inquiry was out the about the past and about the laws and policies of the former government. To be offered the position as president was, of course, a privilege, a, a deep privilege for me in my professional career, primarily as a commercial international lawyer, especially as it offered the opportunity to act in a national role with a statutory mandate to monitor compliance by the government and the private sector with the human rights treaties to which Australia is a party. Very interestingly, of course, a debate that is now very much part of today's discussion in relation to same-sex marriage and the protection of religious freedom. But as the public battles over asylum seekers, over Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act, and the Dondale Detention Centres, where 95% of the juveniles are Indigenous, as these issues raged, there were times, of course, when I wished I was somewhere else, at least back at my desk with my commercial law firm advising our clients. But I do have some 40 or so cartoons of me uh, to explain to my grandchildren and they range from all sorts of things, and perhaps so we could uh, have a look at the first of them. Um, well, the, 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 ha, could we have a look at the first of them? That's the first, this, this one I really love. This is, of course, what you can do with technology, but it put me and the, all of the commissioners at the Australian Human Rights Commission as, as, as a motorcycle gang, and at that time, I think we were objecting or raising concerns about the um, mandatory uh, extra 15-year prison sentence uh, that you would be subject to if you associated with um, 
with, with bikie gangs or with known members of prohibited bikie gangs. I was a bit worried because my son's a bit of a bikie and I thought at some stage I have, might have to be rescuing him from, from a Brisbane jail. Um, then we look to the second one. This one is um, me uh, as a, as a jackbooted fascist um, uh, trying to protect the 18C provision of the Racial Discrimination Act, which of course we now know efforts to reform it have failed ignominiously, uh, mainly because the multicultural Australian community rose up and said we need that provision to place a limit on the right to freedom of speech where that right uh, is um, in the public arena and based on race, because of race. But that was the sort of thing that um, I was a bit surprised to wake up in the morning and see in the newspaper. And the next one is my absolute favourite. This is a James Bond themed um, uh, a, a cartoon. And uh, it's difficult for you to quite get a sense of it, but basically it has me dangling by a hook above a shark infested pool as Mr. Abada, former Prime Minister, circled in a submarine and the Attorney General watched stroking a cat. I was about, I think, to escape up a ladder to the sky above and the caption ran underneath Triggs, Gillian Triggs. Well, I'll be very interested to see what my grandchildren have to make of all of that. But in thinking about the challenges that face women today, I might tell you, if I may, a little bit about myself, because it perhaps explains how I'm here. I was born in London in 1945, just after the bombs were dropped in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, bringing an end to a second catastrophic world war in the 20th century. I was fortunate to be born into a new world of optimism that the future would bring opportunity to everyone. The 50 or so nation states in the world at that time had agreed upon a global rule of law through the United Nations Charter and upon the human rights to underpin world peace set out in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. A declaration, by the way, that Australia's Dr. Evatt, that rather fasty and brilliant lawyer, uh, actually forged with an extraordinary level of influence as a president of the General Assembly, ensuring that the declaration was passed without a single negative vote. Well, I grew up in a sort of Paddington Bear kind of world in a London terrace house, going to ballet classes, becoming a professional ballet dancer, and spending the weekends with my parents at the National History Museum in London, which they thought was good for, good for me and my sister. I came very reluctantly to Australia when my parents moved here and eventually entered the University of Melbourne's Law School. Well, these years at university were stimulating ones. We had the privilege of an almost free university education right up to my ultimate PhD uh, in, uh, uh, in the United Kingdom and America, and the certain knowledge on graduation that we would get a job. We were a highly political generation, marching in moratorium protests against the war in Vietnam. Uh, we read Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex. We adopted slogans to make love, not war, and we burned our bras metaphorically speaking, because sadly they had to go back on again when that day came that we had to go to work. So women of my generation rode the crest of a wave of opportunity over the following decades with no university debt and the firm and evidence-based belief at that time that with education, discrimination and barriers to women's economic empowerment would be dismantled. Indeed, the introduction of federal laws to implement the conventions prohibiting discrimination on the grounds of race and sex were groundbreaking advances, eventually followed by laws against discrimination on the grounds of age and disability. Germaine Greer wrote The Female Eunuch and The Feminist Revolution was in full bloom. As Dr. Pangloss would say, all was possible for women in the best of all possible worlds. And indeed, this seemed to be the case for the following decades up to the 80s. Women were educated and entering the workforce and public and political life in unprecedented numbers. But from the 90s, women's economic empowerment slowed. And today, the position of women is now declining. Uh, the World Economic Forum's Global Index makes quite distressing reading. 10 years ago, Australia was ranked 15th in the world for the economic and political empowerment of women. Today, we're ranked 46th. We are 61st in the world for political engagement, 77th for ministerial positions, and 54th, 54th for labor force participation. The gender pay gap around about 17% um, 
uh, continues as a, as a significant problem. And you have made, may have noticed in the paper just a couple of days ago, the Workplace Gender Equality Agency just released its national gender equality store, scorecard. It reports that while more employers are prioritizing gender pay and employment practices of flexibility and reviewing their promotion on leave standards, the pay gap was worsening, is worsening in Australia across all but two of the categories that were measured. That is, management, executive positions, all professional services, technicians, trades, clerical and administration works, workers, in all of these areas, the pay gap is widening. But as you may be very well aware, financial and insurance services have the highest pay gap at 31.9%. It's fallen, it must be admitted, from 36.1% the year before. Superannuation balances at retirement for women is 46.6% less than men, and women over 55 increasingly are retiring into poverty and homelessness. Female representation on boards has stalled with about 21% of women on Australian Stock Exchange 200 boards, but 30% of those boards have no women at all. Women still do the unpaid caring work. Women are still the ones most likely to be on um, casual work or contract work as distinct from continuing positions. And of course, we have the now shocking data to underpin our understanding of sexual um, assaults and harassment. 25% of women reporting sexual harassment at work and the Commission's inquiry into sexual assaults and harassment on the 39 university campuses confirms continuing high rates um, of assaults and harassment. And of course, we have the, again the continuing figures of domestic violence where a woman is killed on average once a week at the hands of their partner or former partners. And one shouldn't forget, of course, that men are also killed in much smaller numbers in domestic violence. And last year, 25 children were killed in Australia as a consequence of that. Now, one can go on. I'm sure you know all of those statistics as well as I do. But here's the statistic that I think is really the most astounding uh, for me and my generation. And that is that in the Global um, uh, uh, in Index for the World Economic Forum, Australia is ranked number one in the world for educational attainment for women. Now, I suspect there's not a woman in this room uh, who would be surprised by that. We know that Australian women are extraordinarily well-educated, highly motivated. Our parents and the government and the entire educational system has pushed us through, and we have emerged, and I'm sure you've emerged, in, in top-ranking professional positions with very high levels of education. And that is the mystery. How is it that Australian women are so well-educated Yet this has not delivered the expected outcomes of economic empowerment or engagement with public life. Something has gone terribly wrong. The optimism that I saw and the opportunities that I had in the 60s are now evaporating for many women. Well, compounding these statistics is the demonizing of women in the public arena. There appears to be a growing tolerance for and permission to diminish women in the public arena and to abuse those who demonstrate leadership. Prime Minister uh, Julia Gillard, as we all know, uh, was subject to quite extraordinary levels of attack. Uh, she pushed back with her misogyny speech, but nonetheless, she suffered the ultimate fate of losing her position. And then we see other examples that are of great concern to, to me in my former position, and that is the rise of uh, Islamophobia in Australia. It is a, it is a data-based fact uh, now uh, that women in particular, and this is very curious, but women in particular wearing the hijab and burqa have become a lightning rod for public abuse and for Islamic, uh, Islamic um, negative comments. And a recent one, um, the Muslim woman Jasmine, who was pilloried for her comments, perhaps inappropriate, uh, on Anzac Day, but it's yet another indication of just how vulnerable these women have become. And of course, I've had my own personal experience at the hands of Senate estimates for eight hour sessions um, with no legal advice and more importantly, no food. Well, why? Well, again, I suspect you know all the reasons and the Business Council of Australia has just put out yet another um, uh, statement explaining why this is happening and what we need to do about it. 
Um, female staff leave to care for children, cutting into their superannuation. They fall behind on pay raises, which of course can be compensated for. Uh, rising understanding of unconscious bias. Very interesting fact I didn't know till I was uh, doing a bit of research for, to think about today's presentations. Men apparently are much more willing to negotiate pay rises outside the usual cycle, whereas women stick to the process. Women do double the unpaid care work of men. They remain the primary carers for their parents, children and disabled. And they are the most likely to suffer from cuts to penalty rates. Uh, among others vulnerable in the community. Well, what, we could, what can we done, do about it? Well, there's a lot that can be done, but my concern is that we've been talking about what can be done about this for now, the last, at least the last two decades, without producing the changes. Why are we going backwards? How have we slipped in a relative position from 15th to 46th globally? Now, one might quarrel with the statistics and how this is done. I, I can't. Uh, I can't deny that, but you, you, you can uh, uh, say that to move from such a position to such a low position has got to have something in it that's of worry and of concern to Australians. Um, we can argue for the business case, and we've done that a lot at the Australian Human Rights Commission. Um, it's not really our business to argue a business case, but you know better than we do that when you employ women, you increase the um, diversity, the originality, uh, the, the uh, initiatives and thinking of a board or of a, of a company. Uh, you, there's a lot of American evidence in particular that share prices increase with women on the boards and women in senior management positions. Um, one can argue this, and the business case possibly carries greater weight than the human rights arguments that I would make from the uh, Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. You can talk about cultural changes at board levels. You can encourage role models. You can review traditional views of merit, although I think it's a very dangerous thing to do because women meet the merit in any event. We're number one in the world for educational attainment. Merit is not the issue. The issue is the failure for women to move forward. Now, there's a lot of self-help books for, for women. They're all over the place. Do we lean in with Sheryl Sandberg or do we lean out and take a more passive role? There's endless conflicting advice that women give to other women and I don't really want to want to add to that except I thought I would tell you just one uh, example uh, that that uh, particularly impressed me some few years ago I was invited to be on the silk selection committee for the New South Wales Bar Association and you will all know that to be selected as a silk is the, one of the great um, uh, privileges of the legal profession it's a recognition that you are um, senior and highly respected by your colleagues. It's a peer-based process. There are very few women silks at the New South Wales Bar. There are some. The particular year that I was in, and I should say this had nothing whatever to do with me, uh, other than the fact that I was on the selection committee, um, it was a very unusual year uh, because 50% of those that were ultimately selected as silks for that year were women. Normally, of 25 or 30 that are selected each year, you might get four or five women. This year, a particular year, there were 50% women. And we started to say, well, how has this happened? How did such a high percentage of women get accepted as silk when this has been such a difficult thing to achieve in the legal profession globally, um, but certainly in Victoria and New South Wales? And then we started to look at the, at the paperwork of who applied for these for silk. And we realized that the women who applied for silk and who were successful in getting silk were ticked through the system because they were ripe or overripe for being recognized as silk. They wouldn't put their applications in for silk until they were pretty certain they were going to get it. Whereas the men, talented, they'll probably get it in the end, the men put their applications in two, three, four years before they were ready for it. And it's part of this, this phenomenon of men, looking, uh, uh, men looking for pay rises outside the, outside the usual cycle. Men are much more willing to say, I'm putting my hat in the ring. I'm, I'm saying I'm ready for this, even if you think I'm not. I'll try again next year. I don't mind. I can cope with rejection this year or even next year because I'm going to get it the year after. But I want the profession to know that I want to be recognized as silk. Women will not do that, with some rare exceptions. They will say, I'll put it in when I feel I've met the, met the requirements for the position 
and when I'm reasonably confident the answer is going to be yes because I don't want to be subject to the gossip around the bar that I applied and failed. And I think it's a very interesting metaphor for, for, the, for, the, for the issue. Well, what about the future? I don't really have any glib or simple answers. All of the things that the Business Council or the Australian um, Bar Council is suggesting, they all make sense. Greater flexibility, cultural change. Um, I'm a little concerned, and it's perhaps a little controversial to say this, but I'm very concerned that we've placed so much emphasis on male champions of change. Um, as a 60s feminist, I can't believe that we're saying we have to rely on men to get us into these positions. But there is a recognition that you need people in power to push these changes. You need leadership, and wherever that leadership comes from, uh, then we need it as friends. Uh, I think women have really got to work much more closely together. We're perhaps too fractured. Um, we, uh, I don't have, as I say, answers other than uh, to do, in my case, what I've been trying to do. Do your homework, get your facts right, get the law right. It's not difficult to do, certainly not in the areas that I've been working in. Much more difficult for you in tax, but I'll leave that to you. Get your facts right, and then be prepared to stand up for what you know is right. Be willing to take those risks. One thing that I have learned in my job is that you have to push back against false news, against um, uh, uh, Co uh, Anne Conway's uh, position uh, of alternative facts. You might recall that when she was defending the White House Press Secretary's statement that those that attended the inauguration of President Trump um, uh, were the la was the largest gathering ever for any presidential inauguration ever in the history of mankind, it was objectively false. But she decided to defend the Press Secretary by saying he simply presented an alternative fact. There's no such thing as an alternative fact. And we have to get our facts right and be prepared to put, uh, put those facts uh, in, a, in a measured and, and factually accurate way and push back against false information about women. The endless issue of, um, of not being committed to the job, not meeting merits, uh, etc. Another aspect that, I, that has been important, I've learned, and, and, and it's nice to know at my age of 72, we're still learning, um, and I'd have to say, going, picking up the theme of, of, of being, the, being uh, sort of the feminist of the 60s, and there's nothing like being 72 to be liberated because there's almost nothing anybody can really do to you anymore. Uh, you're not dependent. I'm not dependent on a job. I'm not dependent on anybody's patronage. It doesn't matter what people think. I can say what I like and people can disagree as much as they like. But one thing I have learned is no matter how carefully planned your speech, no, no matter how much work you've done, no matter how clever you are in presenting your point, the thing that people respond to, in my experience, more than anything else is authenticity. You can muck it up even, you can get it wrong. You can back away, apologize and move forward. But if you are acting honestly, and if you come across as somebody who is honest and acting in good faith, that will carry you further than all the, uh, the, the glib and, and, uh, and, and elegantly produced speeches or work or documents. Um, transparency is enormously important. Uh, we have to be, get our work out there in a transparent way. Uh, I was also asked to talk about life-work balances. Um, and I was speaking to somebody having a cup of co coffee this morning, looking at the, this beautiful view and enjoying the conversation. But I'm not really a great fan for life-work balances. I'm not at all sure that it even exists. My feeling, and, and, and I, I share this with you quite genuinely, is that I've really loved my professional career for the last 50 years. I love going to work. Um, I've loved the opportunities to work with the people I've worked with and to work in the areas that I've worked with. Um, and for me, it's never been about work-life balance. I think if, you're, if you really enjoy what you're doing and you learn to do it reasonably well, then enjoy it, flourish in it. Um, I find that uh, I long to get back to my garden, but a week later I'm saying, where's the world going? I've got to get back to work. Um, I've been fortunate, of course, to have a good family support. My children are very happy to see me work. But I'm, I'm not sure that we should be so concerned about balance. I think the, if, you, if you have a, a reason for your work and you've got the education and the skills, then use it, enjoy it, and flourish and, and be enriched by it. And I think of perhaps above all, to get out into the public arena and to speak up. Use this education and skill that you've acquired. Uh, uh, and I think for women, 
to work together more. And perhaps I could, if I could finish by saying, um, I think we've played the game as women. Certainly my generation have. Um, we've worn the, the jackets. We've got the pearl earrings. I don't have them on today. Um, we've been measured. We've been careful. We've been educated. We've been respectful and courteous. But I'm wondering if we haven't been a little too courteous, a little too cautious, a little too measured. Maybe we need a little bit more of an edge, a little bit more vulgarity, a little bit more of being out there to present these facts and demand that something happens to improve the position of women. Mm -hmm.